بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا ومولانا حبيبنا محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته very happy to talk here about a topic which is uh, near and dear to my heart about Islamic bioethics this public lecture will be um, about an introduction to the field throughout this week we will have uh, more than a um, lecture uh, about um, uh, this topic so I will try just to introduce the field in general um, uh, and then the coming lectures inshallah through the week we will get into details about um, uh, other issues <clears throat> this is the outline of um, the outline of the talk today so we will speak about two uh, <clears throat> phases of the field of Islamic bioethics. The first one is the, what we call pre-biomedical revolution. Before we have the genetics, the genomics, the DNA, uh, the IVF, all the high technologies, high biomedical technologies uh, before this. How, how did it look like hmm, the ethics related to medicine? Uh, we will speak about the epistemology, specifically sources of knowledge. How did religious scholars get sources of knowledge in order to answer the questions and address the questions related to medical ethics? We will speak about the scholarly disciplines that were involved, where we can find relevant information, and every now and then we refer to the key works with relevance to medical ethics <coughs> coming from these different disciplines. And the second part of the talk today will be about the contemporary Islamic bioethics, how it works now, how it works. In order to answer the uh, <coughs> breathtaking challenges posed by biomedical, uh, modern biomedical technologies. Again, we will speak about the epistemology, how do religious scholars get sources of knowledge in order to answer uh, questions raised by these modern biomedical technologies but still rooted in the Islamic tradition. We will say uh, something about the methodology moving from the individual to the collective ijtihad. We'll speak about that. We'll speak also about main voices and key publications uh, for those who want to have an idea or quick references about the field of Islamic bioethics. <coughs> This is the outline of the, um, our talk today. Uh, uh, about, the, um, classical, uh, about the classical medical ethics. So we speak here roughly up to the end of the 19th, beginning of the 20th century, more uh, even up to the end of the first half of the 20th century. Up to the 1950s, 1960s, we still speak about um, these classical medical ethics. Um, um, how did it work? What kind? Um, and how did Muslim religious scholars um, found it? And I think uh, this uh, part of the lecture is quite important. Uh, because uh, sometimes we think of Islamic bioethics as something completely uh, severed from the history. Uh, so there was nothing in Islam and in a sudden, in an overnight, because of the questions related to cloning, stem cell research, IVF technology, etc., we are trying to uh, um, uh, go quickly and answer the questions without actually no um, tradition behind us. And to the extent that some uh, people working in the field, whether biomedical scientists, uh, by the way Muslims and non-Muslims, um, uh, some researchers would say, what would you involve Islam into these issues, although they are quite modern and Islam goes back um, 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 uh, centuries behind. So what's the point? So this is an important one to see that when we speak about Islamic bioethics, we are standing on a very solid ground and discussions will root 
rooted in the um, tradition and we speak about rigorous uh, discussions. So I will try to spend some time explaining how it worked before the biomedical revolution uh, for this reason, uh, for the justification why do we ha have now or can we have now a field called Islamic bioethics. <clears throat> the epistemology. Uh, when we have questions related to med medicine, starting from the very basic question about medical treatment, if I am sick, do I have to treat this disease? And if not, why, of course? And if yes, what kind of treatment, what kind of drugs, what kind of therapy, what kind of encounter between the physician and the patient, uh, um, um, uh, many things uh, which makes the very basic and the core business of medical ethics inside or outside the Islamic tradition and from the beginning of human history, not something new. Uh, how did Muslim religious scholars do that? Um, uh, to uh, the, the best of my uh, insight and understanding, religious scholars worked with three types of sources in order to get the knowledge they need in order, in order to answer these questions. One source, which is very um, expected, the religious sources, starting with the scripture, scriptural sources, the Quran and the Sunnah. And the second one, the Sunnah, uh, received uh, intensive intention to the extent that uh, we will have uh, um, uh, in the third, fourth century of Islam, a whole genre called prophetic medicine, based completely on the second source of the Sunnah. So Quran and Sunnah were the starting point, like it happens for any other discipline within the Islamic tradition. And then, uh, um, uh, besides the scripture, there is also the scholarly tradition around the, the scriptures. Uh, so, so the traditional disciplines like fiqh, Islamic law, like Islamic theology, Sufism, um, Adab, etc. These were all um, disciplines which contributed to building up uh, uh, the discourse on um, classical medical ethics. So these are the religious um, 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 sources, which will take some time explaining it later on. But they had also the medical sources, because um, a very important um, uh, uh, component of answering any question, uh, uh, not necessarily from an Islamic perspective, from whatever perspective, the, the, to start with, you have to understand the question. If you don't understand the question, any answer will not be right, yeah, because your approach is completely wrong. So in order to understand the question, you need um, a, a know-how uh, about the field, the medicine, in this regard. Uh, uh, when, it came, when it comes to medicine, uh, a, a great bulk of the sources came from outside the Islamic tradition. Specifically, the translations coming from Greek medicine. These books were translated, available in Arabic, uh, some sources, but to a lesser extent, coming from other civilizations like the Indian um, uh, medical tradition or Persian medical tradition. But the Greek was the most dominant one uh, in the discussions. And we have um, um, a good uh, number of um, evidences uh, and proofs that demonstrate that uh, Muslim religious scholars, including jurists, had access to these medical sources. They consulted them when they were writing their answers and writing their own um, uh, books. I wrote an article, an extensive article about this issue uh, on um, embryology in the Islamic tradition published in the Journal of Islamic Law and Society, uh, explaining how uh, religious scholars, I think between the 12th and the 15th century, uh, um, 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 uh, dealt with uh, medical sources related to embryology the development of the embryo in the uterus. So we have enough evidence that religious scholars had access to these sources uh, with different degrees. Uh, some, some religious scholars had um, quite superficial knowledge. Others were quite advanced to the extent that some uh, wrote critiques um, to the medical sources they had. 
based on their own background in the um, uh, religious uh, or in the discipline uh, they were specialist in. So they, they had access to medical sources, they consulted these medical sources in order to be better informed about the issues they handled. Of course, by time, uh, 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 medical sources uh, or um, the science of medicine was um, uh, the, the Arabic was the lingua franca of medicine. So e even physicians who want to study medicine, they have to do it in Arabic. So in the beginning, it was Greek in a Greek language, then translated, and then it was completely internalized and Arabized, um, so that um, um, everybody almost would write uh, in Arabic. And if you want to have the most updated and, and, and sophisticated information on medicine, you have to know Arabic in order to be aware of uh, this science. Uh, the third one are the philosophical sources. Um, um, unlike the situation we have now, where we have so many disciplines and sub-disciplines and categorizations and sub-categorizations, people are not even specialists in medicine, they are specialists in a specific branch of medicine or in a specific organ, uh, like heart physicians or brain physicians, but not on everything in the body. Uh, in the, in the pre-modernity age, Mm. Uh, people uh, were encyclopedic in nature, not the fragmented knowledge that we have now, but there was an um, encyclopedic character of knowledge. At this time, medicine and philosophy were more or less very difficult to separate from each other. So uh, um, great physicians were also great philosophers and vice versa. So again, also the sources about medicine, when they are translated, you will have also uh, uh, information about medicine and vice versa. So, for instance, um, uh, the, the Greek tradition or the Greek physicians uh, who wrote about medicine are the ones who also wrote about philosophy and philosophical thoughts and theories. And medical theories at this time were based on a specific cosmological understanding. Uh, so these separations and, and fragmentations that we have now was not the nature of knowledge and epistemology at this time. So, for instance, they had theory about the four humors, الأخلاط الأربعة, that the human body is composed of four main components, eh? the blood, phlegm, yellow pile, and black pile. It's something that any student or physician would hardly uh, um, um, recognize what we are talking about. But these were the basic theories in medicine, whether it's Greek or Islamic at this time. But this theory of four humors uh, were presented uh, in a book by Hippocrates, the father of, of, of Greek medicine, called Nature of Man. Speaking about the nature of man, and there you have a theory about uh, medicine related to medicine. Uh, um, uh, this theory of the four humors were linked with uh, how we understand the cosmology. It was always uh, 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 the fourfold categories. So you have four humors in the in the body, and you have four elements in the universe: um, uh, dust, uh, fire, air, and water. Uh, so th there are four elements, uh, the, the main components of the universe, and there are four elements of the body. These four elements are related to four uh, components. Uh, um, uh, there are also four temperaments. Uh, so al-amzij al-arba'a, al-akhlaat al-arba'a, al-anasir al-arba'a, these fourfold categories. So medicine was philosophy. Uh, how we see the world, and that's why uh, they would write about the health condition of the person, uh, that um, whatever you see, you have to link to the season. Uh, was it spring? Was it autumn? Was it summer? Uh, when you see the symptoms of a disease, uh, you have to link to the age of the person, you have to link to the temperament of the person. All these things disappeared when we started focusing on uh, the molecules uh, of our bodies and getting more and more into depth. So the big picture was um, um, started to get more and more missing. Uh, of course, these are some of the critiques uh, to medicine in the modern time, outside even Islamic bioethics, that we are um, too much focusing on these uh, particles and mole uh, even at the molecular level um, uh, of the body, and we miss the big picture. But anyhow, this was the medicine that Islam did not invent, but that was there before. So there was medicine and there was philosophy. 
say. And um, religious scholars had access also to both, uh, the medical and the philosophical. And uh, many of them, when they speak about medicine and medical treatment, etc., they raised their concerns about this mixture uh, between medicine and philosophy, and that some physicians would uh, misuse medicine in order to infuse some philosophical heretic ideas to the people and some of the religious scholars wrote about this. But anyhow, these were the sources of knowledge which um, uh, composed and constituted the epistemology of the religious scholars when they address issues and questions related to medicine and medical ethics in the pre-biomedical revolution age. Now, dear method, how, how did they answer these questions? How did they write about what we now call bioethics? We, di we didn't have a discipline called medical, Islamic medical ethics. It did not exist. So in the, in the, in the categorization of knowledge, when we read, we don't have a discipline called medical ethics. But we had other disciplines. And within each of these disciplines, we will find that the specialists there addressed some of the questions which are very much to what we now call bioethics or biomedical ethics. Uh, um, so um, it was um, highly interdisciplinary uh, in, in the classical period. So every um, um, uh, discipline is contributing a specific piece coming from it. But so we had theology, we had fiqh, uh, we had hisba. Uh, we will say a little bit about hisba because we will not see it later on. But the point I want to say is the following because methodology is very important here. Religious scholars built up their epistemological system around the scripture. So we have the Quran and Sunnah, uh, we have a society, we have pressing questions in the society, and you try to build up epistemology, system, system, epistemological system, in order to answer these questions. Once you build it up, any questions, you try to host it, within the system you have. You will not create a new system because of these particular questions. So you have theology, it's a discipline with its own questions, own methods, own concerns, own specialists, own qualifications, requirements, etc. The same for fiqh, the same for others. So I will not change my whole system because you came and asked me a question about um, how many days um, uh, maximum or minimum the embryo would need in order to um, uh, be able to survive outside the uterus. No, I will use my own system, my own methods, my own approach in order to answer this question from one side related to uh, my own discipline. So there was what we can say uh, the independence, uh, independence of the epistemological system. The epistemological system was very much internal, built up, homegrown hmm, within the Islamic tradition. When, when, when the books were translated from the Greek tradition or from Persian or Indian or whatever, this did not change the epistemological system. It, it, it remained at, at, as it is, but then they will um, um, uh, vitalize it in order to produce the questions we are looking for. This is a very important point because in the modern time, we will not have this. Uh, <clears throat> so, for instance, when it comes to theology, theology is busy with understanding your relationship with God, man-human relationship, with understanding the um, um, cosmology, how it works, causality. Yeah? Uh, is it a cause and effect? Where is then the will and the power of God, etc.? Within this, you will find discussions about medical treatment, about tawakkul, trust in God, uh, um, about seeking medical treatment, abandoning medical treatment. This is all theology. When it comes to fiqh, fiqh is about religious rulings, uh, specifically about rituals. You have to pray, you have to fast, uh, you have to pay zakat, etc. Within these elements of rituals, you will have find many questions related to medical ethics. Like for instance, I have to pray five times a day, and this prayer must be done in a specific physical movements. What if I cannot do some of these medical movements? I have um, a prayer uh, um, before praying, I have to do the ritual uh, um, uh, purification, tahara. Uh, what if my skin is allergic, for instance, to um, water uh, uh, because of a specific health condition, etc. Uh, these were all be edges, but not in a separate book, 
not in a separate chapter, within the chapters that have been already determined né? within the epistemological system that I spoke about. And then we have the hisba, hisba genre. Hisba genre is about public morality, is about regulating the public space. Uh, I, I am a university professor, uh, but I work with many people in other professions. Uh, um, I need someone um, who knows about electricity. I need someone who, who knows about the computer. I need someone uh, who can drive the car, etc. When these professions deal with each other, how they regulate the public space. Uh, this was the hisba. One of these professionals was the physician. And people related to it, like midwives, uh, for instance, uh, uh, nurses, all this stuff. Hisba produced the literature that regulate the ethics, uh, which we have now as codes of ethics and this stuff, the work of the physicians and healthcare professionals um, in, the, in, the public, in the public sphere. And then we have prophetic medicine. This is one of the very important genres and disciplines that um, 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 give us a lot of information based around the scripture of the Sunnah. And then we have Adab al-Tabib. Adab al-Tabib literally uh, um, um, etiquettes of the physician. Uh, usually written by physicians themselves uh, uh, um, uh, by giving advice for physicians, for their colleagues, uh, how to behave like a virtuous physician, uh, uh, um, um, a physician with ethics, with etiquettes. We will also um, uh, say uh, stuff about this. So uh, um, um, I will give some examples. Uh, uh, about the disciplines and how they contribute, uh, just uh, to show that uh, 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 medical ethics I is not something that has been born in vacuum because of the modern questions that we have about cloning and genetics, etc. The very nature of the Islamic tradition necessitates, necessitates interacting with questions relating to medicine and health condition. You cannot practice the Islam without having to deal with such questions. Uh, when it comes to uh, theology, for instance, theology, for instance, to start with, uh, we have to uh, know um, um, what kind of God we believe in. Hmm? What is this God? For instance, is he all-powerful or not? Uh, is he omniscient, omnipotent, um, 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 is his power limited, is his knowledge limited or not, etc. Uh, there is a chapter in theology about predestination. God predestined everything. He pre-planned everything from the beginning, etc. We know from available sources that uh, 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 many people, companions of the Prophet, of Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam uh, uh, raised questions related to what we now say interplay of theology and 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 and, and medical ethics. Uh, before Islam, Arabs used to have a fatalistic approach, living in a desert, very much depending on rain in order to herd your animals, to um, um, uh, uh, deal with your own uh, needs. If not, you just have to wait, move a little bit, so looking for uh, water. Uh, if it comes, you are very happy. So you are very much depending on nature. You can hardly do anything. When the Prophet um, uh, um, uh, preached Islam among this generation, uh, so they had this fatalistic approach in mind. So when they thought all-powerful, omniscient, uh, etc., uh, so um, uh, would be also fatalistic, can be fatalistic, the one who determines everything uh, for, from, from um, in the primordial time, etc. Everything is pre-planned, so we actually just have to submit to what he did. So uh, some of the companions, and it seems from available uh, texts that we have, that this question was raised by more than one person in more, on more than one occasion, in more than one context. So they would say, if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala pre-planned and predestined everything, 
So for sure, he also pre-planned, predestined our health condition, that we get sick, or we are healthy, whatever. So what is the point of seeking medical treatment? Hmm? If our belief in this type of God, who knows everything, who has the full power to make the course of life um, uh, go into a specific direction, what is the point of, making, of seeking medical treatment? Uh, the answer of the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, was more or less a, um, a uniform one, the same answer. So the question would vary a little bit, but the answer would be here, these medical treatments, these drugs, here min qadarillah. So if we believe in divine predestination, why should we medic use, use drugs and medical treatments? The answer is medical treatments make part of this predestination. Uh, it's a very simple answer to the point, but uh, later when we have the disciplines, we will have a very elaborate discussion about this very short answer and its relationship and its application to medicine and medical treatment. Uh, to get it simple and to get the long story short, uh, um, uh, uh, religious scholars say, the mainstream interpretation would say that the Prophet ﷺ wanted to teach them God is not like the nature you believed in before. Uh, God is um, uh, planning things according to laws. It's not haphazard, he's not a dictator who just determines that this person will be healthy and this person will be sick and we have nothing to do about this. We get, we live uh, healthy because we do certain stuff. We deviate from this healthy condition because we made wrong things, etc. Things went wrong. And then we have to fix them back by going back to the laws, natural laws which do that. So, um, 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 Qadarullah, God's predestination is not only that you will get sick, but that how you will recover, how you keep yourself um, health. And these things are not a hidden knowledge, it's not ghaib. It's something that we can study, it's something that we can know. That's why the Prophet ﷺ said, as part of God's divine justice, believe in absolute divine justice, whenever Allah sends down a disease, He would necessarily also send down the treatment. But then He says, عَلِمَهُ مَنْ عَلِمَهُ وَجَهِلَهُ مَنْ جَهِلَهُ uh, it's, it's, it depends. If you have the knowledge to it, you will apply it. If you don't have the knowledge, you will not apply it. So this was a clear encouragement to seek uh, knowledge in the field of medicine. And this also explains, of course, the golden age of medicine in the Islamic um, um, civilization. Because imagine theology was uh, drafted and composed differently. That actually it's all fatalistic, we, the, the man has no hand in this, we just have to accept what happens, uh, how would it look like uh, the field of medicine. So this is the very basic concepts of theology which you cannot move around without addressing things related to medicine and uh, the, the, the very foundation uh, of, of the discipline of medicine. That if we have a different theology, we may um, end up not having the field of medicine at all. Uh, the second thing is uh, um, um, uh, also a, a very important field full of references to medical ethics is, is the jurisprudence or the fiqh. Uh, it's very difficult to practice the very basics of the rituals, again without having a little bit of know-how uh, about, um, um, about, uh, about medicine. I gave the example of uh, a purification ritual, purity, tahara. Um, I gave the example of praying. Uh, there is fasting also. Fasting for one month for every adult person um, 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 who is a Muslim is an obligation. But there is always the condition uh, that uh, um, for those who can do it, as long as you can do it, as long as your health condition would permit it. Okay, but which health condition would permit it? Which health condition wouldn't permit it? When this will be um, too risky to fast? When it will be uh, just a, um, a basic level of uh, hardship, mashaqqa, that the person should um, um, uh, uh, should live with, etc. You need some information from medicine in order to answer these questions. Uh, 
Uh, that's why we have uh, specifically among the uh, jurists, among the fuqaha, um, a genre uh, or a class of uh, scholars uh, who were interdisciplinary. Uh, we had the phenomenon of al faqih al-Tabib and al-Tabib al-Faqih. Uh, um, 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 a class of scholars, of physicians, who are well versed in fiqh. Or a class of the fuqaha who are well versed in, 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 in medicine. And we see this very clearly in the biographies. Bi biographies, in, in, in historical biographies, are usually um, uh, classified per discipline. So you will have the biographies of uh, physicians. Tabaqatul al -atibba. So it will speak only about the physicians. You will find some uh, in, the, in, the, in, the, in, in, in the collection of um, biographies of physicians like Ibn Abi Usaybi'ah, uh, some people who are well known also as faqih. Uh, you will have also in the biographies of the jurists, al-fuqaha, and sometimes you have tabaqat al-fuqaha, and sometimes tabaqat uh, or, or the biographies of uh, jurists of a specific school, like tabaqat al-shafi'iyya, al-hanafiyya, al-malikiyya, etc. You will find also among these people some important religious scholars. Among, among the Maliki jurists, uh, prominent Maliki jurists, we have Ibn Rushd, Averus, who wrote a very important uh, fiqh book called, uh, called Bidayat al-Mujtahid wa Nahayat al-Muqtasid, uh, translated into English as the jurist's premier. Um, this is one of the very famous books in fiqh now. It's a textbook on fiqh. Uh, and he was also a judge. He was appointed as a Maliki judge. Uh, uh, um, uh, but he is a very important physician. You see him in the, in the biographies of the physicians, like the one wrote by Ibn Abi Usaybi'ah. Uh, uh, you will find among the, the jurists of the, um, of the, of the uh, Shafi'i um, um, jurists, for instance, you will see um, Ibn al-Nafis. Uh, one of the very famous physicians, the one who discovered the, the circulation blood. Uh, um, and he, he is recognized as a Shafi'i a scholar. And uh, you will see this uh, phrase describing uh, some um, religious scholars. Uh, they, they would say, يُرْجَعُ إِلَيْهِ فِي الْفَتْوَى كَمَّا يُرْجَعُ إِلَيْهِ فِي الطِّبْ People resort and go back to him when they have a question about medicine in the same way that when they have a question about um, about um, uh, about uh, fiqh. So <coughs> this interplay and this interconnectedness between the disciplines in the Islamic knowledge, which are usually seen as purely or exclusively religious, although this is a questionable issue, but even if they are classified like this, you would see this interplay, this interconnectedness with medicine and its ethics. Uh, but again, uh, most of the time, we don't have a book Hmm? about the, the, the ethics or regulations or rulings of medicine in the, in the fiqh. We don't have. They are dispersed uh, uh, along the different chapters. The same in theology. Uh, sometimes we have few exceptions uh, uh, to this, like, like this one. Uh, ah, sorry. Uh, like this one uh, on your right side, Ahkam uh, al rulings related to patients. Ahkam uh, al is uh, written by um, um, a Hanafi scholar, a jurist, um, who lived in the 11th century, Hijra, Tajuddin al Hanafi, Ibn Tajuddin al Hanafi. What Ibn Tajuddin al Hanafi did is that he collected all the examples of the rulings related to people who are in a, in a, in a bad health condition, the, the patients, the sick people, from every chapter, starting from Al Tahara up to uh, a book he called Kitab al-Dawa. This is the last chapter in his book. Uh, uh, he collected it. Again, the epistemological system remains intact. So the same chaptering, the same categorization of chapters, he just collected uh, the um, elements related to uh, uh, um, uh, the patient. So this is a faqih who collected uh, the rulings and he said um, why he did this. He said um, it was a personal uh, uh, motivation. He said, I get um, uh, sick very often and most of the time I don't know what to do and then I have to consult 
uh, such voluminous works in order to know what to do as a patient. The, um, uh, 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 so it's just a personal um, um, uh, motivation uh, that um, uh, he um, made him write this book. Uh, uh, just um, um, uh, collecting, uh, work of collecting what's relevant for the patient. The other book on the left side, Mu'idu um, al Ni'am wa Mubidu al Niqam. This is a book which falls into the category of Hisba. Uh, the public morality and regulating uh, public space. The problem is that this one. I think you have to close one of them. It's, it's Closed? It's too much. Where is it? It's this one. But I think you hear me without the mic. Do you still need the mic? I can shout. <laughs> no? This one is okay now? Okay. Now it's better? Okay. Uh, so the other one, Mu'idu Ni'am wa Mubidu Niqam, is about public morality. We have a very um, uh, important um, um, uh, jurist, Tajuddin Subki, a Shafi'i Faqih, uh, who wrote this. He had a chapter, um, uh, number 83, uh, on the physician, uh, um, rulings related to the physician. Uh, um, what the physician uh, should do. He spoke, for instance, about truth-telling uh, when the end of life approaches. If I'm a physician and I know that the days of the physician are number, the patient are numbered, what should I say? Should I say to the physician? Very modern, um, has a very modern relevance to our time now. He spoke about this, how to communicate uh, um, with the patient, etc. Uh, but again, as I say, these are just at the side of the um, exceptions when we have a book, a whole book, um, uh, trying to collect um, 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 relevant topics from a specific, um, uh, from a specific discipline. Uh, now I move to another discipline which also um, 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 uh, contributed uh, uh, a lot uh, to the field of medical ethics in the classical period, which is the prophetic medicine. Uh, prophetic medicine in Arabic or Atib Nabawi or Tibb Nabi, uh, uh, um, we have uh, um, a great number of works to the extent that we can speak about. Um, uh, a distinct genre uh, of, of writings. One of the earliest, if not the earliest, work related to uh, prophetic medicine, uh, what is called al risala al zahabiya li al Imam al Rida. Uh, um, uh, one, one of the Imams for the Shia, but also a very uh, respectable scholar in the Sunni tradition, Risal al Zahabiya al Imam Rida. Imam Rida died 203 Hijra. Uh, and uh, it seems that this book was written at the very end of his life, so between two, two, 201 and 203, uh, uh, stuff like this. And uh, um, 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 I, I read myself for Salah the Habi. It's a very short one. I have reservations about classifying it as a Tibb Nabawi. It's actually Greek medicine, much more than, than prophetic medicine. Uh, but this is how it is um, 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 uh, categorized. So we cannot say it's a Shi'i medicine. Uh, we cannot say even a Sunni medicine. I would say it's m much more Greek medicine. But there are some references here and there which you can link them to a Quranic verse or to a Hadith, etc. Uh, but this is one of the earliest. And then we have uh, the famous ones. Um, uh, famous ones. The one written by uh, uh, the one written by Al Imam Al Zahabi in the 8th century Hijra and Imam Ibn Al-Qayyim in the um, 8th century Hijra, also the 14th century. Um, uh, these are famous ones. All these books are written by scholars, specialists in the disciplines I spoke about. For instance, related to hadith, they are hadith scholars, or they are um, specialists in fiqh, they are fuqaha, or theologians, etc. But we have also physicians who wrote about prophetic medicine. Uh, 
Uh, so they would comment on uh, prophetic traditions related to medicine, but as a physician, not as a religious scholar. Uh, like, for instance, here we have uh, this one, At-Tibb min al-Kitabi wa sunnah and sometimes called Al-Arba'oon at tibbiyah we know Al-Arba'oon in Nawawiya, it's it, uh, um, commenting on a, uh, 40 hadiths in particular, it's a very well-known uh, habit in the Islamic uh, history. Uh, he, he tried to do um, uh, Al-Arba'oon at tibbiyah uh, to, to collect 40 hadith related to one topic, that's uh, uh, medicine. Uh, this is Muwaffaq um, al-Din uh, Abdul Latif al-Baghdadi from the 7th century. Muwaffaq uh, um, al-Din uh, Abdul Latif al-Baghdadi, according to our records, is the first physician to get involved in prophetic medicine. So we will have here physicians who write about ethics, uh, but f from his background as, as, as physician. Again, uh, knowledge was not that compartmental as it is now. So we have someone who is a physician, but also he, who has a good know-how about religious uh, sciences and disciplines. And um, after about one century, uh, we have another physician who wrote also a very important uh, book, Al-Ahkam Al-Nabawiyya Fi al sanaa al tibbiya This is Ibn Tarkhan Al-Hamawi. Ibn Tarkhan Al-Hamawi died 720. Ibn Al-Qayyim died 751. The book of Ibn al-Qayyim on, on uh, Tibb al-Nabawi had extensive quotations from Ibn Tarkhan al-Hamawi. Although nowhere Ibn al-Qayyim made reference to this book. And he never mentioned the name of the author or the name of the book, which raises questions about uh, um, um, uh, the book of Ibn al-Qayyim on, on, on Al-Tibb al al-Nabawi. Uh, um, pages and pages are quoted literally from, uh, from the book. Uh, but this also happened many times with many authors. Al-Ghazali also about Qutl uh, al-Qulub, um, Abu Talib al-Makki also quotes pages without uh, referring to him, etc. It seems things were different than when we are now. Um, so anyhow, if, 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 if the book has been peer-reviewed, uh, it, it, it would have come with different conclusions. But th this is a very important book, and all these books are now published and they are um, available. Uh, these um, el, el, el prophetic medicine, uh, some people would find it uh, uh, weird and strange to speak about it as, as part of the classical medical ethics. Most of the time now, I would say prophetic medicine has been more or less uh, misrepresented in the modern time. Uh, for different reasons, but maybe one of them uh, because of our um, concern sometimes over-concern, sometimes we can even obsession hmm? uh, uh, by showing that we have uh, miraculous references in the Quran and Sunnah when it comes to scientific issues. Al-I'jaz al-ilmi fil Quran wa Sunnah. We will not speak about this now, but anyhow, uh, these works on prophetic medicine, they had different parts, different components, different chapters. One of them had to do with the therapeutics, al-adwiya, drugs that the Prophet ﷺ used or prescribed uh, for the people who were sick. And this is the part on which uh, was and still is a great debate whether it is based on religious knowledge that the Prophet ﷺ received from Revelation Wahi, or based on personal experience as someone who is living in Arabian Peninsula at this historical context. Uh, is, 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 it, is, it, is it something religious? Is it something cultural, contextual, etc.? A huge debate. Ibn Khaldun wrote about this in his Al Muqaddimah. He negated the religious origin of, of this. Um, uh, many uh, religious scholars wrote about this in the modern time. So, this is the part which is the most controversial part and is not the greatest part of the prophetic medicine. The greatest part of works on the prophetic medicine are about ethics. So they would speak, for instance, about the profession of medicine and uh, how, how uh, much we need it, uh, how much this profession is well integrated in the philosophy of Islam and in the theology of Islam. Uh, what about Tadawi medical treatment versus the concept of tawakkul, trust in God, the one who predestined, pre-planned everything, as we mentioned in the beginning. Uh, they would speak about um, uh, uh, spiritualizing medicine because there, there is a belief that God is also the healer a shafi. So uh, uh, if you want to uh, treat your disease 
or to improve your health condition, you have to ha have good link and good relationship with the healer uh, through, for instance, charity, uh, through, for instance, uh, praying, ruqya, uh, etc. But also, a lot has been written in these books about improving lifestyle. Uh, which we call now preventive medicine, tibbil wiqai. So they would say uh, how a person should be moderate in eating, in drinking, in um, uh, doing physical exercises, etc. Uh, they would speak about also cross-gender relations, one of the big issues now uh, when it comes to bioethics in the modern time. Uh, should men be treated by a woman or women should be treated by a man? Um, 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 uh, there are some references even on uh, um, uh, females visiting male people patients and vice versa when the people are sick. So all cross-gender relations were part uh, of, of, of this genre. Etiquettes of visiting patients, what to say when you, when you visit a patient, how uh, commendable it is and how moral and how ethical it is to visit someone who is sick and what kind of words to say to this person. And of course also etiquettes of the physicians and virtues of the um, um, uh, physician himself. So we have a great source in, in, in prophetic medicine when it comes to the, uh, to the classical period. Uh, the last um, uh, discipline to speak about in the, in the classical period uh, was Adab al-Tabib. Yes? Would it be a good time to stop for Maghrib because we are already... Yeah. Uh, shall I finish this part? Because the other part will be about the modern and then we take a break. Fine? Okay, uh, Adab al-Tabib, um, or etiquettes of the physician, uh, was a very important discipline as well. Uh, um, in the modern discussions, when we try to link uh, um, uh, bioethics to our tradition, most of the researchers, they would base themselves on this genre, Adab al-Tabib, that we had works in the Islamic tradition, speaking about Adab al-Tabib, most of the time about physician-patient relationship. <clears throat> this is one of the very early works, uh, um, this book, um, uh, Adab al-Tabib, written by Ishaq ibn Ali al-Ruhawi. Ishaq ibn Ali al-Ruhawi, we know hardly anything about him. Uh, so we don't know whose teachers are, whose students are. Uh, we have some ideas about where he lived because of Ar-Rahawi, al Nisba, al akhira Ruha, uh, which is now at the borders of Syria, Turkey, and Iraq, uh, somewhere. Uh, we know that he lived in the third, uh, um, uh, the last third of the third century. Uh, ninth century. Uh, um, we know that he was a physician. We don't know for sure if he was Muslim or not. And if you read the book, it becomes impossible to know if he's a Muslim or not. Uh, uh, um, but he is a believer. He, he mentions God many times. Uh, every time he's praising God, uh, he's speaking about the power of God about the necessity that the physician would have trust in God and not to be full of himself or herself because he's able to treat the people, etc. So we have a religious person, a religious physician, not necessarily a Muslim. We don't know till now and the researchers have done their best by going through the country in which he lived. They tried to understand the ethnography of this city, um, how many Jews, how many Christians, how many Muslims, uh, what kind of religion did these physicians do, we still do not have any conclusive evidence. But the point here that it shows that what uh, Brother Shauqi was speaking about this morning is that um, the, the dominance of fiqh now, uh, so that we have all the time speaking about ahkam, halal, haram, etc. Uh, and the one who can speak about this is not only a general Muslim, must be a Muslim anyhow, but must be one who is trained in the fiqh. We have here a very important source on medical ethics in the Islamic civilization, and we don't know even the religious character of the person, not to mention that he is a faqih, in the sense that we can speak about ethics outside the fiqh. 
uh, and this is a very clear example about this. And then we have Akhlaq al-Tabib, uh, written by Abu Bakr al-Razi, Nut Fakhr al-Din razi by Abu Bakr al-Razi, the earlier one, uh, who lived in the fourth century, uh, the, the Islamic uh, Hijra, and the, the tenth century. And we have also, fi bayan al-haja ila al-tibbi wal atibai wa wasayahum for Qutb um, al-Din al-Siraji, um, sorry, Qutb al-Din al-Shirazi, uh, from the eighth century, 14th, um, 8th century Islamic Hijra, the 14th century. Um, uh, what, did he, what these people discuss, the topics that, it is, that they discussed, it's, it's, it's works on virtue ethics, as we call it in the modern time, virtue ethics. The, the virtues of the physician himself or herself. Humbleness was a very important one, repeated by all the people who wrote on Adabul Tabib. Because they had the fear that the physician, because of his ability to treat diseases, and it happens many times, the success happens many times, that they would think that causality uh, is a necessary work. And that once you do that, you will get that. Once you do that, you will get that all the time. So at the end, I am the one who is doing everything. So God uh, will be out of equation, something which we see in our modern time. Uh, this was uh, treated in their work by um, asking for humbleness, التواضح, عدم العشب, عدم الكبر, trust in God, توكل على الله, uh, believing that the success of, her, of his work has to do with his trust in God, not only um, uh, being sk sk skillful, uh, not being talkative also. They, they wrote uh, much about the, um, the image of the physician, that the image of the physician would be a respectable person, not a talkative person, someone who is well-dressed. Um, 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 they spoke about confidentiality. Um, uh, uh, how important it is uh, to keep the secrets of your patients, not to tell um, their secrets to anybody. Um, they spoke very much about professionalism and how important it is, and that uh, they warn people against charlatans, uh, against malpractice of some physicians. Um, they spoke about the necessity of having an overall examination uh, for uh, physicians, how the profession of medicine should be regulated in a professional way. Uh, this was all written in Adab al-Tabib. Also the relationship with the patient, patient-physician relationship. We spoke about the obligation of treating the poor, uh, something which we miss in the, in the contemporary discourse about bioethics. Uh, uh, which is the economic and the financial part. We spoke this morning about uh, about financial ethics, about capitalism and um, business ethics, etc. So they, they said that the rich would go to the physician because they need him and they need his expertise. But the poor would also go, but they cannot afford. They cannot pay him as much as the rich do. So they said one of the virtues of the good physician is that he feels obliged and under necessity to treat the poor as, uh, as much as he also treats the rich. Nowadays we have um, um, drugs coming to the market. So the, the, there was a couple of weeks ago, um, you take one injection for two million dollars. One injection for two million dollars. Who, who is gonna afford this kind of medicine and these kinds of drugs? And in the modern discourse uh, of bioethics, you hardly hear anything about this. Uh, so it's all about switching on, switching off life support machine, etc. But about this business ethics and economic and financial ethics of the drugs, um, we don't have it. But in, in the past, we did have. Supervising the patient's nutrition. As I said, they were treating the person as a whole not just one organ, one specific molecule, etc. So what the, what the physician eat was also an important part. Following the patient's health condition after taking the prescribed drugs, telling truth and ways of communication. I mentioned uh, this uh, before, how to communicate your message in a truthful but compassionate way to the, um, uh, to, uh, the patient. Uh, this is more or less how it worked what kind of disciplines contributed to what we call classical um, Islamic medical ethics. I will stop here, we take a short break, and then we go inshallah to the contemporary discussions and contemporary bioethics to see what kind of changes and shifts we had. Assalamu alaikum. So <clears throat> in continuation of what we started, we move now to the contemporary Islamic bioethics. Uh, so we speak, as I said, roughly 
the discussions from the 1950s, but uh, more precisely from the 1980s, for reasons I will speak about later. Uh, uh, um, we had a revolution in, in, in biomedical sciences, a revolution that almost every, everyone recognizes. We look at human body not in the way that we have been looking at uh, um, in the previous centuries. Uh, the knowledge that we have now, or at least this is what we think, the knowledge what we have now about a uh, human body is unprecedented. Uh, we have cracked the code of the human body, how it works at the molecular level. We know about uh, the whole genome. We know about the gene, how they work, how they interact with each other, at least for a great part. Of course, this would raise also another question, other questions, other type of questions uh, with um, a different level of complexity um, and difficulty. And uh, um, uh, both scientists, physicians, patients, general people would like to know uh, how far we can make use of these new technologies. Uh, um, what is ethical, what's unethical? This is not a question for Islamic bioethics, but this is a question for bioethics in general. Whether you are a secular believer, non-believer, Christian, Muslim, you need to know how your old system, uh, your old moral world can be revitalized to function again in this age of modernity and produce answers for these new questions. Of course, the challenge is twofold. The first one is that you, un you understand the challenge and the questions. And the other challenge is that you provide answers relevant to these questions, but rooted in, in, in your tradition. So for instance, if we speak about secular uh, bioethics, uh, there must be a philosophical tradition which goes back to the Greek, to Aristotle, uh, and uh, later on Kant and others. That's why we have Kantian ethics and uh, utilitarian ethics, which work in bioethics. Also Kant was not here when we have this biomedical revolution, but we still go back to uh, uh, this tradition, even Aristotle. There is a book called Aristotle and Embryo, speaking about um, embryology and uh, thinking uh, um, an Aristotelian thinking, how would it look like? So everybody is using his tradition. Uh, it's, it's not something peculiar for Islam. This is one point. The other point, as I said, it's not the first time that, that uh, Islam and uh, specialists in the Islamic tradition are trying to use this tradition to answer questions related to medicine. And by the way, uh, being modern is something relevant. So the questions that were posed by Greek medicine when it was translated into Arabic and the religious scholars had were modern questions for them. Uh, these were new questions, modern contemporary questions and challenging. And in an article I refer to um, about embryology in the Islamic tradition, it's, it's, uh, uh, um, uh, it was very clear that it was challenging. And the religious scholars had different interpretations for the um, um, uh, books written by the physicians on embryology, etc. But now, OK, we have this, this modern question of bioethics, and we try to deal with how, how does it work now in the uh, contemporary Islamic bioethics. Again, we go to the epistemology, sources of knowledge. One source of knowledge remained the religious sources, the Quran, the Sunnah, and the disciplines built around the, the two scriptures, the Quran and Sunnah. Uh, the main difference here is that the scripture itself, which is more than, more than 1,400 years ago, and the disciplines, which go back a couple of centuries ago, are very remote from the modern context. So the expectation that you find references with direct relevance to the questions you are addressing and grappling with becomes more and more unexpected. And so you cannot think that when I read the Quran or even the works of fiqh or whatever, I will find something about genetics directly. Very um, 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 uh, unwise, if you think so. 
Uh, so it, it, it became you, you need to do much more digging into these uh, and, and critical reading and deep reading, which we call deep excavation, al amiq, so that you can come up with some relevant um, uh, sources. This is number one. The second one is the biomedical. We added bio to the medical in the classical period. So we have now bio because we have the biology, etc. cetera. Uh, not Greek anymore. In the classical, it was the Greek tradition translated into Arabic. It's not Greek, but it is Western scholarship. So if you want to know about biomedical sciences, uh, um, uh, you have uh, to be aware of what's happening in these academies and universities, uh, research institutions, um, Silicon Valley, uh, here in the US, whatever. Is the Silicon Valley here? No. Are here? Oh, okay, so we, we are close by, so we are not very far. Uh, yeah. So you need to have uh, to be aware of Western scholarship in order to be well versed in biomedical sciences. And these are not available in Arabic. So Arabic is not the lingua franca of science and biomedical sciences anymore. This is an important change. The third one, the third source, is the bioethical, which replaced the philosophical. In the, in, the, in the classical period. The, 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 the bioethical uh, has become dominantly secular bioethics. So uh, um, uh, speaking about God, uh, revelations, scriptures, etc., it becomes at the margin. We still have Catholic bioethics, we have Jewish bioethics, but always at the margin. When you speak in public, you have to speak secular language. Again, this part is not available in Arabic, uh, like uh, the works of the important bioethicists here in the US, like um, Beecham and Childress, etc. These things are not available in Arabic. So things change it. It's not the same intellectual landscape as it was before. If you want to understand the reality related to the biomedical and the ethical questions raised by this biomedical, Arabic is not enough to start with. This type of scholarship is not produced by your own civilization, Islam in this regard. It's not necessarily anti-Islamic. But it is not Islamic, it is not part of the Islamic civilization. It is not produced in the geographical setting where you have Muslim majority countries. It's something outside Islam as a civilization. Before, this was not the case. Um, another important challenge is that number two and number three, the, the, especially number two, the biomedical, is becoming much more normative than it was before. Let's uh, differentiate between two categories now for your convenience so that we can follow the discussions. The informative component that we have information. We need to know how our body works. This is informative. But then normative. From this information, we try to make normative statement about good and bad. So we differentiate between the informative and the normative. Usually medicine was informative. You have information about how body works, but how body works shouldn't say something about what is good and bad by necessity or by default. In the modern time, the biomedical or the normative part of the biomedical is getting much more than before. Much, much more than before. Let's take a, a simple example, which we witness in the Gulf region, in the countries where we work, like Qatar, like Saudi Arabia, Emirates. If I want to get married, sh should I ask a physician? Normally, I ask my father, my mother, uh, my friends maybe, uh, the partner I want to get married with. These are the people who are consulted. But the, the physician, what has the physician to do with my marriage? Now, <coughs> because of modern genetics, 
we know, we can predict, if a couple get married, that their offspring may get genetic diseases. Because we know the genes in every uh, person, and if these people will marry, there is a probability and all the, the, these things can be calculated, statistically speaking, how many percent, etc. Et, et in the Gulf region, or in the Gulf countries, the a percentage of consanguinity is quite high. In most of the countries, more than 50%, especially first, first and second cousin marriage. Uh, it seems because, among other factors, uh, this high level of consanguinity uh, uh, minimizes the genetic diversity and then brings uh, or produces children with genetic diseases. So countries thought this genetics will be now a very good thing that can help us. So started to question, uh, started to question, first of all, consanguinity hmm? because of genetics. Now we will judge consanguinity that maybe it's not something good. Second, we will say to the people, we cannot say it's haram, hmm? but we can say. Uh, 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 we will create procedures before these people get married. So now, by law, in, in these countries, you have to do premarital genetic test. You have to. If you don't have this 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 certificate, you cannot get you cannot register your marriage. So geneticists are interfering in marriage now. To say this is a good marriage, this is a bad marriage. What they didn't know so far is that if, if, if the genetic test says as, said that there is a probability that you will have children with genetic disease, they will not say to you, you cannot marry. But you have to know the information. And then you decide, that's fine. Some countries would go a bit further and would say, you want to get married, fine. But then you have to meet parents who have children with these genetic diseases. To see it with your own eyes, how they work, how they deal with the children, etc. Of course, all the point here is that you minimize this type of marriage. So consanguinity became under uh, problem, uh, would be frowned upon. Why? Genet the, the modern genetics. Um, um, of course, we have pre-modern discussions about consanguinity. Most of the time based on personal observation and based on uh, traditions related to the Prophet, but we know it's fabricated, it's not authentic. And it is, it is not uh, authentically attributed to the Prophet of Islam. Some people would say, and this is written by some religious scholars, genetics would prove the authenticity of these texts. Yes, they can prove that they may be uh, right and sound, but would not say that the Prophet said them, because the Prophet died already. He said what he said and it's finished. So, so you see here how genetics can become normative. Not informative, but normative. We'll judge how we should regulate our life, with whom we should marry, with whom we shouldn't marry. So the scope of the biomedical dramatically increased. And we have now the phenomenon of medicalization. Things became medical, although they were not before. It has been medicalized because we have evidence-based medicine. We can tell you that's good and that's bad, and what we say will get proven and demonstrated by time. But with this increase of the influence of the biomedical and, of course, the bioethical, the knowledge of the religious scholars who are specialists in number one here, their knowledge about two and three dramatically decreased. So the phenomenon of the physician jurist and the jurist physician almost disappeared. We can have very few exceptions, but disappeared. The second thing is that when the two and three has been born and grown outside the Islamic tradition. So, if we speak about any biomedical technological advancement, it's something that we watch on television first in the Muslim world. It's something done by others. Even if these others are like me, they are Muslims, but 
the whole stuff is done outside. Uh, um, uh, so, in order to judge the act, uh, this biomedical technology, for instance, or using it for specific applications, in order to judge it, you have to understand the information, the question at hand. But you have no access to this information as a religious scholar. I myself, I studied at Al Azhar University. At Al Azhar University, uh, which is, for those who don't know, a religious university where uh, people study Sharia and this stuff. Uh, uh, when uh, I was, I think, 14 years old, uh, me and my colleagues, you had to choose the literary section, or what we call adabi, or the scientific section, ilmi. If you want to study Sharia, you have to take the literary. If you want to be an engineer or physician, you take the scientific. 14 years old. I took the literary, for instance, to, to study Sharia later. Uh, uh, you, you, you will not see in your package anything that has to do with biology, with science, with medicine, anything. The second, English hours for English will dramatically decrease. Those who take the scientific will get much more. So you have no English and you have no science. So your access to two and three is almost, becomes almost zero. I remember when I finished, I wanted to, uh, and, I, and I thought that bioethics is an interesting field and I want to study this. I, was, I didn't even know the difference between gene, genome, uh, organ, uh, molecule, very, very basic things. I, I didn't know what all these things mean in Arabic, not to mention in English. So, so it becomes almost impossible to do your work. Uh, um, uh, we have another uh, lecture by the end, which will be about the challenges. So we will keep these challenges uh, for the time being. But I mentioned this uh, in order to show you what, what uh, kind of shift happened. So if we have religious scholars now who will not answer your question, if I ask you, what does Islam say about X? And you don't know what X is, can you give an answer? It becomes impossible. Just mission impossible. So we have religious scholars now who do not know the X. How can we speak about Islamic bioethics then? So it was a deadlock and a problem. And uh, the, the, these challenges started in the 50s and 60, 60s when people discussed the topic of contraceptives, the modern contraceptives, birth control and this stuff. And when they discussed organ transplantation. Uh, it became clear that the religious scholars do not understand uh, what's happening and it's very difficult for them to follow up. And those of them who are well versed and they try to understand what medicine is, they would read the books which are available in Arabic, that their predecessors, Salaf from the jurists, w would mention in the books, like Kitab al Qanun, Canon of Avicenna, and this stuff, Al Hawi, Al Razi. And these books are not books on medicine. These are books now on history of medicine. So, so physicians do not know these books and do not know these people and they don't play a role in medicine. So even if you try to do your best and go back, you will become a very archaic physician, not, not a modern one who knows, uh, who have a know-how about modern medicine. So what was the solution? The quick solution is to move, was to move from the individual approach to the collective approach. Uh, this is how it used to work most of the time. You have a question, you go to the religious scholar, individual religious scholar gives you an answer, which we call it fatwa or opinion, whatever, and that's it. In the modern time, we will have the question, but if we went to this one, he will not understand what I'm speaking about. So how to solve the problem? They moved from the individual to the collective. The question will go to a group of people, not only one. This group will, be, will have interdisciplinary background. Mainly people specialized in the religious sciences, ulum sharia as we call it, twin brackets, and in the biomedical sciences, the biomedical scientists will be there. Biomedical scientists will explain the question at hand, the informative component. On the basis of this, alhamdulillah, on the basis of this, the religious scholars would give the normative component and judge the act if it is good or if it is bad. 
then you will have the resolution, qarar, or whatever. This uh, part, the collective part, uh, the collective ijtihad, uh, has been institutionalized. So we have now three institutions who are active in the field when it comes to bioethics. That's why we don't have at the moment, when we speak about mainstream Islamic bioethics, we don't have school-based Islamic bioethics. So we don't have a Hanafi opinion on palliative care. We don't have a Maliki uh, position on cloning. It's not working like this anymore. So the schools are part of the history, the tradition. But when we speak about different opinions, they are usually attributed to institutions, not to schools. So I would say, for instance, the Islamic Organization for Medical Sciences said that. And the Islamic Fiqh Academy in Mecca said that. The Islamic Fiqh Academy in Jeddah said that. The most active is the first one, the Islamic Organization for Medical Sciences, IOMS. It took this name in 1984. They started working in 1980. They had a couple of conferences, and then they got the name, official name, the Islamic Organization for Medical Sciences. This one coordinates with two other uh, institutions uh, which work on Sharia in the modern time. Uh, among others, of course, the bioethical questions, by the way, also uh, Islamic finance and uh, economics and this stuff. Uh, so the, the one is the Islamic Fiqh Academy affiliated with the Muslim World League uh, and the International Islamic Fiqh Academy affiliated with the uh, um, uh, Islamic um, uh, Organization of Collaboration, the Organization of Islamic Collaboration. A cooperation, uh, Organization of Islamic Cooperation, Muslim Town Islam. Uh, um, 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 how um, um, uh, does it work there? <clears throat> Usually, you have a question. Like, for instance, uh, Dolly was cloned, the sheep. Dolly was cloned. So, we have a big question about cloning. So the people in these organizations, or one of these organizations, would ask biomedical scientists to write papers in Arabic about this big question, cloning. What is cloning? What does it mean? What kind of questions it raises, etc. And then they will say to them, you write these papers for a general public, not for your own colleagues. Because here, the religious scholars are general public. They don't know even the basics of science. So no jargon, no technical terms. Everything must be simplified. Any technical terminology must be explained and defined, etc., etc. Once these papers are finished, they distribute them among the religious scholars so that they will have, they will understand the question at hand, the informative component. And then scholars would write their own papers based on what they understand from the papers. Sometimes, if they have some difficulties with the papers they have at hand, they can also contact the authors, uh, the biomedical scientists who wrote these papers in order to understand some difficult stuff. This all happens before the conference. And then they convene a conference, the organization would convene a conference, distribute the papers beforehand, written by biomedical scientists and religious scholars, and people would come together. Not only the authors of the papers, but also others, whether biomedical scientists or religious scholars, for discussion. Each author will present the paper shortly, of course, because the papers have been distributed beforehand, and then starts the mutual discussions among the religious scholars themselves, among the biomedical scientists, and between uh, both groups all together. By the end of the conference, the conferences, their conferences usually continue two, three, four days, maximum five days. Um, by the end of the conference, throughout the discussions, it becomes clear that more or less there are specific points or elements upon which they have agreement. This, th these points of agreements will be drafted as a draft for final recommendations, and then they are discussed in a final um, session in order to approve the recommendations. Once approved, they are uh, um, adopted as a resolution or as a fatwa, approved by the institution, not just by the people who wrote the papers. So for instance, it will be 
the recommendations of the IOMS, the, the institution in Kuwait, or the one in Mecca, or the one in Jeddah, etc. How do they do that? They try most of the time to come to consensus that everybody agrees. And that's why they always try to avoid uh, the uh, controversial points, uh, uh, like UN um, um, deliberations. If it happened that there is this agreement, they would vote. And the majority would count. What about those who disagree? Most of the time, they accept it. You have to swallow what happened, because th these are collective deliberations. This time, you couldn't convince the majority. You couldn't take the majority to your side. Maybe next time, you will be in the majority, your colleague in the minority. This is how it works. Uh, sometimes, but very few, some religious scholars would think, no, this is a break point. I, I will never accept that. To be in my name, even my name is not written by name, but still, I, I will never let it go. So what will happen? You will have the right to write by, by a, a, a appendix to the resolution that X or Y or Z disagreed with element one or two or three because of argument one, two, three. Can happen and it happened sometimes. Uh, um, um, uh, and then you have the regulation. After the meeting, they will disseminate the final recommendations, uh, especially the last meetings. You will find Al Jazeera, for instance, uh, covering what happens. Uh, they have websites on which these things are published, etc. But they also publish the full proceedings, not just the one or two page recommendation or resolution, but all the papers and um, uh, sometimes also even the script of the, uh, the oral discussions are published. So you will have, for instance, uh, when it comes to the beginning of human life, when you discuss the beginning or end of human life, you will have a couple of pages as a recommendation, but the full uh, proceedings would be published in um, um, 1,000 pages, around 1,000 pages or even more. Um, uh, so uh, th these are also um, 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 one of the outputs of, of, of these. Uh, most of the topics, almost all the topics in the modern time have been discussed this way. So you will have a conference, uh, you invite biomedical scientists, religious scholars, deliberate together, full proceedings and recommendations. Sometimes, but this happen, doesn't happen often, but sometimes uh, uh, you will see that by the end of the conference, they do not agree. Uh, they cannot agree even on the basics. What do they do? They will identify the controversial points, what was missing, then they will commission others to write about this, and then they will meet again in order to come to a conclusion. <clears throat> One of the most controversial ones was IVF technology. Test tube babies, as we say, it's artificial uh, insemination. I hope everybody understands what I speak about. Assisted reproductive technology, ART. Uh, it took them, I think, three or four years to come to a conclusion. But this was also one of the very first that you have discussed, so it was not that easy. Uh, like cloning, for instance, in one conference, they could come to a conclusion. So it depends. End of human life, about death, it took them about two, three times to come together, to come to a conclusion. So some topics get difficult, uh, sometimes against our own expectation. We think it's clear, it's straightforward, but it doesn't seem to be, etc. Uh, um, uh, in order to give you an idea, concrete idea, about the people who participate in these meetings and in these conferences, we have here uh, uh, the um, uh, biomedical scientists, uh, uh, samples of the people. So we have here, um, at your left side, Abdurrahman Al Awadi. Abdurrahman Al Awadi is the um, is the president, the chairman of the Islamic Organization for Medical Sciences in Kuwait. He is he is a Harvard graduate. Uh, he was minister of public health in Kuwait, and he is also the president of the IOMS. And then we have here Sadiq Al Awadi, also a very important geneticist from Kuwait also um, regularly participates in the meetings of these uh, organizations. And then we have here um, Muhammad Ali Al-Bar, an internist, 
uh, from Saudi Arabia, originally from Yemen, also one of the very important and one of the very few uh, who are usually described as the uh, physician of the jurists and as a jurist of the physicians, the old uh, phenomenon. Faqih al atibba wa tabib al fuqaha as you call him. Perceived always as a very respectable person in these meetings. Uh, and, and then you have here Haytham uh, al Khayyat from the World Health Organization. Uh, from Syria. And then you have gynecologist uh, Hassan Hathout. Uh, he died a couple of years ago. Uh, he was living in Egypt, in Kuwait, but the last part of his life was in uh, here in the US and I think in California also. He had, yes, the center, uh, Islamic center. Yes, it seems you are close to everything, also Silicon Valley and uh, Hathout Center, Allah yarhamu. And then we have here uh, Ahmed Al-Gindi, a pharmacist uh, uh, from Egypt. He is the uh, Secretary General Assistant uh, of, of, the, of the IOMS. Uh, these are people who write papers, who participate in the discussions in these meetings. And here are the religious scholars. As you see uh, at the left here, we have Muhammad Ali at taskhiri from Iran, a Shia scholar. Uh, next to him, you have Abd Sattar Abu Ghudda from Syria. Uh, next to him you have uh, Yusuf al-Qaradawi from Egypt, living now in Qatar. And then you have al-Khalili here, uh, the Mufti of Oman, an Ibadi scholar. And then you have um, Muhammad Naim Yassin from Jordan and uh, Ali al Qaradaghi uh, living in, in, in Qatar, I think originally from um, uh, Iraq, um, is a um, Kurdistani scholar. Uh, so. Um, 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 as you see here, the religious scholars uh, dress are dressed differently, but they also think differently. Uh, they, they, they are not uniform in their thinking. So when Shi'i, when Ibadi, uh, majority Sunnis um, from different ethnicities, uh, from different countries, etc. Also their way of thinking. Some of them are very much um, um, uh, inclined to um, uh, to be what we say um, um, to, to make life easy for people. Others are hardliners. Uh, some people are literalists. Others are uh, maqasid oriented, uh, etc. Uh, this makes the discussions difficult, uh, especially in the beginning uh, when these collective and interdisciplinary discussions started, but it also makes it um, much more credible and reflecting um, the actual landscape of thinking in the Islamic tradition at the moment. <coughs> um, 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 one question before we move forward. Uh, do these organizations, their recommendations, uh, creates consensus? So if we, if we binding ijma, so if we have, for instance, the organization in Kuwait or the one in Mecca or the one in Jeddah come to something, does this mean I have to follow? The answer is not. The answer is not according to them. They themselves don't see their product as something binding. And that's why these institutions also disagree with each other. So you may have a position uh, taken by the organization in Kuwait, but not shared by the organization in Mecca, not shared by the organization in Jeddah. This is not always the case. This is not usually the case. This is rarely the case that, this, that they disagree with each other as they did with uh, uh, determining end of life if uh, brain death is death. So the organization in Kuwait accepted brain death. The one in Jeddah accepted, but the one in Mecca did not accept. Uh, so they disagree. So sometimes there are disagreements, but most of the time they agree. But even if they agree, even if uh, two or, or the three, it's not consensus, it's not binding. But it is, of course, much more authoritative than an individual religious scholar for the reasons we mentioned. That as, as an individual Muslim, I would trust this group much more than one only. Because this religious scholar does not have access to the informative component, to the bioethical, to the biomedical, the bioethical, etc. So it, it creates much more credibility, but it's not authoritative. Is it possible for one religious scholar to disagree with these institutions? Yes. And we have many examples about this. <coughs> and, uh, <coughs> Uh, the, the, the one in Kuwait and the one in Jeddah, uh, they have representatives from almost all Muslim countries. The one in Mecca, all except the Shi'i. So Iran is not represented in the, in the, in the, um, the, the one in, uh, in Mecca. Uh, to give you an idea about <coughs> 
their publications, the publications of these institutions, uh, um, uh, the one in Jeddah, they have their own um, um, uh, journal, Majallat al Majma' al Fiqh al Islami al Dawli. So they publish the proceedings of each conference as one of the issues of their, of their journal, of their majalla. Uh, the one in Mecca, um, the same thing. Uh, uh, they have their own journal. The one in Kuwait, the IOMS, they don't, they don't have a journal, but they publish books, edited volumes. So every conference, the proceedings of every con conference is published. <coughs> <clears throat> Again, I don't want to uh, spend much time about the challenges because we will have a dedicated a lecture dedicated to this. But w one of the problems, for instance, is that the product of these organizations are almost 95 or even 99 percent Arabic, not available in English, and sometimes not available at all. If, if it comes to the full proceedings, it's very difficult to get their books uh, um, uh, for reasons that we will speak about or if you raise questions about this, I will answer. Uh, but this is one of the questions, uh, one of the challenges and the difficulties that we have. Uh, um, 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 the collective Ijtihad didn't put an end to the individual. Still, individual physicians write. Uh, like Ibn Tarhan al Hamawi, who wrote about al Hakam al Hakam We have physicians also who write about ethics, like this book, Al Tabib, Adabuhu wa Fiqhu, written by um, uh, Muhammad Ali Al Bar. And many of his books, uh, he co authored it with uh, Hassan Shamsi Basha, a cardiologist uh, living in Saudi Arabia, I think originally from Syria. So we, we have physicians, uh, Muslim physicians, who write about ethics still uh, um, as individuals, not in the name of an. In, in collective institution, but uh, as individuals. And we have also religious scholars who write their own books, they write their own works, papers, um, books, uh, fatwas, um, uh, in their own name um, about these issues. There, there is uh, this famous book, Al Genome, uh, Genome, um, written by Muhammad Rafat Uthman. He died recently, Allah uh, And uh, this book on uh, organ transplantation uh, by uh, Sheikh Yusuf Al Qaradawi. So the individual ijtihad continues. Um, still, uh, of course, much less authoritative than it was before. And most of the time, most of the time, not all the time, but most of the time, the individual works are very much linked to the collective ones. So you will see the books of Muhammad Ali Al Bar. Almost all of them are based on his contribution in the meetings of the institutions I mentioned. So he would attend the meeting and then write his own paper and his own um, um, uh, insights about what happened in the conference, for instance. Uh, um, uh, Muhammad Rafat Uthman and his work on uh, genome, based on his contributions to the uh, 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 meetings on genetics and genomics uh, organized by these institutions. So um, uh, the individual is the head still continues, but of course uh, in a much less um, um, authoritative form than the um, uh, collective is and um, by this I conclude <clears throat> just want to, want to mention one thing although it uh, belongs to the issue of the challenges we don't have the discipline based approach anymore so we don't have the contribution from theology the contribution from faqh, the contribution from adab uh, all the stuff I mentioned before most of the time now we are very happy if we can answer the questions that we are uh, showered with. Uh, every day there is a question. And this is not the problem of Islamic bioethics, this is the problem of ethics in general. Ethicists always uh, um, lag behind the technology. B because first we must have the technology, then we know what kind of question. So we let people do their work. Once we have a trouble, Ethicists jumped in. If we don't have a trouble, they go ahead. So there must be a trouble. So you react to a trouble. And most of the religious scholars that I speak about here and I mentioned here, their specialization is fiqh. So theology, philosophy, adab, history, all this stuff very much marginalized in, uh, in the uh, discourse. So uh, the problem that uh, Brother Shalki was speaking about, this reductionism, hmm? the reductionism of the Islam Islamic scholarship is multidisciplinary, interdisciplinary, very broad. It has been reduced in the modern time. And th the same problem applies to the bioethics um, um, uh, issue. 
Um, so I, I will stop here. Thank you very much for your patience and my apologies if I was too long. Thank you so much.